All right, we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Last week we were in chapter 8, and I want to, I want to start with the last verse of chapter 8 because there is a principle uh, that is going to continue into chapter 9, and it's Paul has been showing this principle. Uh, he's not just saying it should be done. He has been practicing it and uh, in an extraordinary way, as a matter of fact. But at the end of chapter 8, we have verse 13. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat again, lest I make my brother stumble. Now, what is he talking about? He's talking about that of uh, under Christ, in Christ, there are certain rights and privileges, freedoms that he has. But just because he has those freedoms doesn't mean he has to do them. If that freedom is non-productive, that is, if it is offending others, others are offended by it, that is, they are stumbling because of it. As uh, one uh, older preacher uh, said many years ago, it's stumble, not grumble, all right? You can't keep people from grumbling, but it's to keep them from stumbling in that there are certain rights that maybe you need to forego at this moment for the sake of someone else's soul because they may see this. And in the, in the discussion in chapter 8, it has to do with things <laughs> sacrificed to idols, which is not exactly anything we have to deal with directly in this nation, but other nations, uh, there would be that. Nevertheless, there's a principle, and the principle uh, goes far beyond that of just the things sacrificed to idol. That uh, I may have the right to do certain things, but for the sake of someone else who they haven't learned that yet, or they're not comfortable with that yet, or they haven't grown in faith to that yet, that uh, they see us do that, such as, in, in this case, someone, a, a Christian Corinth, eating something that is sacrificed to idols. Well, someone who hasn't fully grown out of that out of idolatry, may see, okay, I get it now. Being a follower of Christ just means you're adding Christ to all these other gods that we already worship. He's just being added. So there would be uh, all the, the Roman gods plus, I would say there would be, the Roman gods really are, are just updated versions <laughs> or altered versions of the Greeks, Greek gods. But with them plus Christ. Well, that's stumbling. That is stumbling. And someone living in that day, understanding that, being aware of that, may decide, you know, I don't have to eat this. I can eat something else. I can be happy eating just, you know, something that came directly out of the sea or that hasn't been sacrificed or just vegetables for today. And it, the things that haven't been sacrificed in that idol, I'll do it for this person. And it is a, a, a serious thing. And we go back to verse 9, so 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, but beware lest somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. And uh, that's, that's what we need to be aware of, that just because we have knowledge of something doesn't mean we have the right attitude toward it. And as I made mention maybe last week, a couple of weeks ago, I can't remember, but I've known uh, individuals who um, especially, especially but not exclusively and not all of them, but especially like young preaching students, especially <laughs> I've seen it in them of, and I do mean very young preaching students, of where they know how to win arguments, they know they can win the argument, but they don't, they don't have the same kind of, of care that, that Paul is talking about. They don't have the same kind of care. And uh, walking circumspectly and walking cautiously uh, to where 
uh, I'm not here to, to trod over you because I've got the truth. I'm here to help you because here is the truth. Okay, I'm here to help because the truth has been given to both of us and let me share it with you. There's a big difference between that and just winning arguments for the sake of looking good or winning arguments because you can. Now, we go to chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and he is going to be first off discussing his apostleship. That there sometimes, uh, the, understand that Paul did have his detractors, as everybody does. He has, he has those that are obviously outside the church. We can see that from the book of Acts. But he also mentions of dealing with problems inside the church. And I know of no congregation that had more problems than the church at Corinth. Others had problems. But I don't know anybody that had quite the, the scope uh, of, of uh, problems as Corinth had in that day. And there would be those that would question his apostleship. And there would be those that would, of course, there, there, uh, anyone opposing what he's written or what he's spoken would attack that first of you do realize he's not a legitimate apostle. He's just saying he is. Or people have just, you know, they've, they've just been taken in by him. But he says this, verse 1, chapter 9, 1 Corinthians, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? And so every one of these, the answer is yes. Am I not an apostle? Yes, he is an apostle. Is he free? Yes, he is free. And he's not talking about the fact that he's a Roman citizen. He's not talking about that. He's talking about the freedom that he's just been discussing in this book, the freedom in Christ. He is free. Have I not? And of course, he's free from the law of Moses as well as uh, uh, freedom from sin. But he is, he is free in Christ. Have I not seen the Lord Jesus, seen uh, Jesus Christ our Lord? Yes, Acts chapter 9, he did. He met Christ on the road to Damascus. Are you not my work in the Lord? Acts chapter 18. He is. If they are not His work in the Lord, whose work are they? Because prior to His visit to Corinth, the church didn't exist. They were not Christians. It is when He arrives and begins to teach that these individuals begin to be taught the truth and they respond to the truth. Are they his work in the Lord? And the answer to that is yes. If I'm not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. All right, is he an apostle or not? Is he just an apostle to Corinth or just to the Gentiles? Well, his mission, main mission is going to be in the Gentile world, yes, he's not going to be in Jerusalem or Judea uh, only in moments uh, of visiting those places. Uh, he is all over the place. And is he an apostle? Yes, while others may deny it, he is saying that they are the sign of his apostle. Uh, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord, my seal of it. Well, how could that be? First off, do they have, and he hasn't discussed it yet, but he's going to in just a few more chapters. When we get to chapter 12 especially, he's going to be talking about the spiritual gifts that are present in Corinth. How could they have received those things except an apostle has been with them? How could they receive it? They've got it because he speaks about the fact that they've got it. They've got it. It's undeniable. How did they receive such a thing? Well, we can go to Acts chapter 8 and we can see how this, these gifts of the Spirit are passed 
down. We have two instances, uh, one in Acts 2, one in Acts 10, of uh, one with the apostles, the others with Cornelius, of where suddenly they were able to speak in tongues. They were able to speak in tongues. Now, now Acts chapter 2, those were the apostles. But we see in Acts chapter 8, no one can pass down these gifts except uh, by the laying on of the apostles' hands. That's the only way they're passed down. And this would be a seal that, and, and if, if some other uh, uh, Christian had gone through there and seen the, the Corinthians that they are in fact prophesying, they are speaking in tongues, that there are obvious miracles that are going on there, they would know an apostle has been here. They would know it. Uh, or somehow all these people have met an apostle somewhere. If the, if the apostle didn't come here, they've gone to the apostle. But they have, they've met someone who is who has that ability, and only the apostles had that ability. And they never, an apostle never had the ability to pass on that gift or that sign of an apostle. They didn't have that ability. They had the ability to, to, to lay hands, and then it was the Holy Spirit that decided, it was God that decided what gift that person would receive. If it was speaking, the person had no control of it, and, and Paul would have had no control over it. It was the Holy Spirit that did these things. And, uh, but someone like Paul or someone like Peter, they could not pass that down to others, that is, of being able to lay hands on people and that next person receive the, the, the gift, a spiritual gift, gift of the Holy Spirit of uh, speaking in tongues or, or healings or whatever it was. It was to the apostles, and when all the apostles died, that ability died with it. It wasn't given to anybody else. And when that generation that was around those Christians that were around those apostles, when they died in time, they would have died. Then all those gifts would have died with them because beyond that, that generation, the church was well established. John finishes the New Testament with the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, we can see, unlike any other book of the Bible. Unlike any other book, you have complete resolution. Complete. You know this is the end of it. There's nothing else. If you go to Jude, you don't get that sense. If you go to Matthew, you don't, you don't get that sense. If you go to the, the writings of Moses or writings of the Old Testament prophets, you don't get that sense. Go to the, the book of Acts. In the books of Acts, you don't get that sense that, that okay, this is, this is now the end. But the book of Revelation is the end. So when, and uh, Paul is going to be writing about this in chapter 13, when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will be done away. Well, he explains what that means. That when the Bible has been completed, when the full revelation from God is completed, then there will no longer be those gifts. Now, let's continue on. In this, which was that whole thing was prophesied not just by Paul, but by Zechariah, actually. Uh, Zechariah, I should say. Zechariah in the Old Testament, he prophesied uh, this as well. Now, he talks about a seal of apostleship in the Lord. Verse 3, my defense to those who examine me, examine me is this. All right? You want to examine the works of Paul, and Paul would have had his enemies in Corinth. Some, not all. He would have some enemies in Corinth because they, he has taught one thing, and others have taught one, the same thing as well. Timothy's been there. He's, he's taught it. You, you have Apollos. He's taught it. There, there are those who, who have taught it, but there are others who have opposed it. And if they are opposed to it, then... Uh, they are most likely going to be an enemy of the truth and those presenting the truth. 
And uh, there are numerous things that are going on in Corinth that are opposition to the truth. Numerous things. Things that have been misapplied, things that are being abused, uh, false doctrine that has obviously been brought in concerning denial of the resurrection entirely. Uh, these are things that have, have been brought in or have, are just homegrown in that congregation one way or another. It didn't come from God and it didn't come from faithful apostles or faithful preachers. This came somewhere else. All right. Now, he's going to talk about the works that he's been doing. My defense for those who examine me is this. Do we have no right to eat and drink? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. And he's going to continue. Now, he's already said that if, if eating certain things, eating as if, uh, therefore, food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat again. Well, he's got to eat but he will not eat the things that might make a brother stumble, and with that principle, or do the things that make a brother stumble. Things that you may have every right to do, but by doing it, it someone else may have a different, different take on it, different interpretation on it, and uh, something that, that could, be, could be known. And it's a, it's a, different cultures have different things. Different cultures have different things. And things that, that you have it just, it just doesn't necessarily click because you're in a different culture. But once you learn it, once you learn it, you know, I better not do that. All right, if, I, if, if let's say we're all at my house, all right, and we don't have any more furniture, everybody, everybody's sitting on the furniture, and I decide I'm going to sit on the floor. If, if I sit on the floor and my feet are pointed toward you, are you offended by that? Does it mean anything to you if I'm sitting on the floor and my feet are pointed to you? Not in this culture, it doesn't. But there are other cultures where you just insulted that person big time. In Thai, in Thailand, you don't, there are certain things you don't do. Now, you learn those things, and people will be patient with you, I have no doubt, because they realize you're not from this culture, you are a stranger, you're outside of this. But there are, there are certain things in other cultures you don't do. So the same thing, you don't touch somebody on the head. You don't touch their head unless you're invited to do so, like a dentist or a barber or something like that. You don't touch their head. And I've been places where I may have offended someone without realizing it, of where I touched their shoulder and I got a look. And it wasn't necessarily a kind look. And I was wondering, what did I just do? I've just offended someone, but I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to. And it's a matter of learning, and it's a matter of adjusting as you learn. Adjusting as you learn. Now, he's saying here in verse 4, we're getting back to our subject, do we have no right to eat or drink? Yeah, of course he does. Do we have no... Uh, do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? And it seems as though everybody else had a, a wife. And he says, a believing wife. Yeah, it says uh, a member of the church, he, they have, uh, a wife has been converted or, or they were already a Christian and married others. He says all the other apostles have wives, uh, and he mentions Cephas by name as having a wife, and we already knew that from the book of Acts, that, uh, Paul, uh, that Peter had a wife, and uh, the brothers of the Lord had wives. Now, Jesus never had one, and uh, as far as we know, Paul, he certainly didn't have one now. As far as we know, Paul never got married. We don't know... Uh, what may have occurred during certain years of the end of his life. And I can't pretend to say that I know. And uh, I, I am one to hesitate uh, using uh, uninspired accounts of what happened, to, what happened to any of the apostles. 
I'm, I'm hesitant to do anything like that. But at least at this time, and perhaps for the rest of his life, no, he was, he was never married. Then he says this, verse 6, Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? Are we the ones that always has to work? Are we the ones that everybody else gets to, yeah, work perhaps a, a little while and then, then rest? But, but it would seem that, that uh, he and Barnabas are given no, aren't given that right. That it seems like they're the, only, they're the ones working constantly and there's this expectation that that's what they must be doing. Well, he has a right. He has certain rights, obviously. Now he says this, and this concerns uh, someone who, and this is by way of principle, that of uh, someone who is teaching the gospel, they are doing this as a profession. They're teaching the gospel. They are, uh, they are a preacher. They're doing this by profession, which is what Paul was doing. Paul was, was traveling around. He's, he's a missionary. Now, there are certain times when he goes to making tents, but he continues to preach. Uh, there's no one there uh, in that particular town uh, that could support him, no congregation. He's there planting uh, a congregation, but there's nobody there to help him. But he says there are rights and privileges here because he says whoever goes to war at his own expense who plants a vineyard and does not eat its fruit? Or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock? And the answer is that nobody. That's not done. It'd be pretty bad if, if the man who's operating the tank in the military has to buy the tank. He's got to go and purchase his own tank. Or he's got to make sure that, that he's, got, uh, he's got to go buy his own food. He's got to buy his weapons and his ammo. He's got to buy all the supplies to do that, that would be a, an extremely weak army. But this would be, nobody does this. Nobody does it. Uh, that, uh, not in the days of Rome. Days of Rome, the soldiers are paid and they don't have to, uh, their, their weapons are supplied or they, they uh, may manufacture them themselves. But but uh, as, a, as an army, but everything is supplied to them and their food is also supplied to them, especially when they are out at war. It's all supplied. And he speaks of two others, one, is, one who works in the vineyard and one who tends the flocks, that they have access to the, the uh, grapes or access to the, the milk of the flock and no one denies it and should not deny it. This is all part of taking care of them and helping them. Now, do I say these things as a mere man or does not the law say the same also? Now, he's about to go to Deuteronomy 25, verse 14. And this is an extremely good passage to show that Scripture has an intent that may be also implied, that there's an implied message. There is the message, but there's also a principle that's implied in it as well. And we see here of where he's taking a passage from the Old Testament and he's showing what was implied by it that the Bible the Bible is beautiful at this it shows us I'm just going to take a minute here it shows us by way of example it shows us by way of direct command uh, but it also shows us by implication and someone would say I don't see implication anywhere we're here is just one place but we have we have people like Paul right now we have examples of them taking a passage and making the implication, finding the implication that's in it, finding the implication and then applying what was implied. We see that. And here Paul is showing it. Watch. 
For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Here it is. Is it oxen God is concerned about? He starts this logic of what has to be implied. So this only goes to oxen and not to men also? Now he's, this is no complaint to God because he knows God is not concerned about oxen. He, he doesn't have a whole lot of concern about oxen. His concern, he didn't die for oxen. He died for mankind. Is it oxen God is concerned about? Or does he say it all together for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt this is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. What is this concern? This all concerns that of a preacher being paid to be a preacher. That's what it concerns. That a, a preacher could have a secular job, could have a different job, but there are certain things he will not be able to do. He can't do it. Uh, his time uh, in lessons will be minimized. His time helping others will be minimized. Can that be done? Yes, it can be done. But there will be things that will be different. But someone who is a preacher does, is allowed to live off the funds of the church as it has been as it has been given to him. He is allowed to do that. And, uh, and I have heard people argue the other direction, and they, they really have no argument. Uh, try to argue the other, matter of fact, I've heard one particular who tried to say that uh, giving, giving as a command is sinful, that one can give, but God didn't command that we give. Well, that's simply not true. That's not true at all. And um, the church has to have the, uh, its, its individual members give. It has to for it to continue. And uh, part of this would be that of having a preacher who is located there and can continue there. And uh, uh, otherwise, uh, the, the church can be, can be hampered. Uh, it's not a sinful thing, but the church can be hampered uh, when uh, it cannot pay for a preacher. And I know congregations where, uh, no one right now, where uh, they don't have a preacher at the moment, uh, they're just going through, cycling through the men, and each one uh, preach, um, and they they cycle to where they don't have to preach that many times per month, uh, but they're just cycling through. Is there anything wrong with it? No, it's not, but they're hampered. They're hampered by it. There's nothing sinful about it. I also know a couple of congregations where they share the same preacher because one couldn't afford to have a preacher, so two of them pay him. And uh, he, like today, uh, he's at, at one spot early. As they, they have to have uh, morning worship very early. So, and uh, he teaches class and he gives a sermon. And then he's got to go to the other one because they too have a morning worship. And, uh, uh, but there, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but he's still getting funds from the church. And uh, now he is going to begin speaking about the fact that he has been no burden on the church at Corinth. He's been no burden and wanted to remain no burden. Have individuals or congregations in, in Paul's lifetime, have there been those who supported him? And the answer is yes. Yes, there were those that supported him, that helped him along. Uh, there were times when he is uh, doing missionary work that he's just going to have to make tents. And he's going to have to pack up. And making tents, that, that is a, uh, just a, a, an easy thing to, to move. 
Like, we're not, yeah, like you've ever done it. No, okay, I haven't done it. But think of, think of tents. Tents are mobile to begin with, all right? And all he has to do is, is have access to uh, someone selling the particular type of fabric that he needs. And, uh, or, and he can, or he can pack up what he's got and, and move right along. And uh, so he has had to do this. And in Corinth, it is a thing with him. And I think it goes back to what we just read in chapter 8, that he did not want to offend or put a stumbling block before them. Now he's telling them, he's telling them he could have been doing it. He's telling them the principle is valid. The principle is there that they could have been paying him or could have paid him while, while he was with them, but he never did. And his work continues and they still haven't done anything and he doesn't want it from them. But we come to verse 11. If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? And the answer is no. It's okay to do that. It is, it's not a great thing. No, it's, it's not a great thing. It's not an impossible thing. It's not an evil thing. If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not used this right, but ensure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. He didn't want to take anything from them so that they... Uh, they, it, it wouldn't, wouldn't hit them too hard in their budget, as we might say. That uh, also going with the principle of chapter 8, the principle there, it, and we could just change the, the wording there in verse th th uh, 13 of chapter 8. Therefore, if taking salary or, or taking support makes my brother stumble, I will never take support from him <laughs> lest I make my brother stumble. He could, he could definitely have, have applied this principle there, but he wanted them to have what they needed for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of that church, for the sake of that church. And notice what he says, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ. There's where the emphasis is. It's not so they could have more money just to have more money. It's not so that they could apply the money, or I should say misapply the money to something else, to their own selfish things or some kind of activity or, or thing they shouldn't even be, in, be involved in or, or doing things they, they should never have, have done. But it's for the gospel of Christ. Verse 13, do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple and those who serve at the altar partake of the offering of the altar? Once again, he's taking things from the past, from the past principles, and they still apply to the present. Principles, he doesn't serve in the temple, uh, except that the church is the temple. He, he, uh, he's talking about the law under the law of Moses, these things were required. Same thing with the, the ox. Don't muzzle an ox as it tre treads out the grain. All right, don't muzzle the priest as he's serving in the, in the tabernacle or, or the temple. Okay, that they partook of the things of the temple. That was, that was all part of taking care of them. It wasn't to enrich them. It was to take care of them. Levi, as being the, the tribe of priests, Levi didn't have any area in uh, Israel that was their land. Now, Judah had an area that was for the tribe of Judah. Benjamin... Ephraim, Manasseh, Reuben, they all, they all had sections of land, but Levi didn't. Levi was actually split up, and, and there is extraordinary wisdom and foresight with God doing that, and I, make, I say that. As, I mean, it's obvious that he would have foresight 
but they lived in various cities and in, and in various places. They're, they're split up uh, and given properties uh, in certain cities or around certain cities. Now, they are to be taken care of. You can't just starve out your priesthood and the same thing goes, you can't starve out your preachers and your workers today. They have to be taken care of. You can't expect them to supply for their own needs. And uh, I've probably talked about this before, but as a particular congregation, I tried out, and this goes back many years ago, probably around 96, maybe 97 at the latest, and uh, where I was warned while there by some members who actually cared, and they didn't like the way the past preacher was treated. They said, you know, they're going to make you do everything. And I said, um, like what? They said, like everything. Uh, you're going to be the secretary. You're going to be the treasurer. You're going to be the the one who takes care of the building. You're going to be everything. If there's legal work to do, you're going to be the one doing it. They they demanded that every, out of everybody. There needed to be a well dug. He the past preacher dug the well. He had to do it, and he's he's the one they require. And there's no no wonder why he left. There's no wonder why he left. And to add insult to injury. He, the, this couple was telling me, and I guess they, they really were giving, <laughs> they, they wanted me if I were coming in to have my eyes open, telling me, you know, what happened to him is that he did all these things and you have all these members who act as critics. They're not doing it, but they'll criticize how it's done. And uh, well, that is in fact insult to injury. And yeah, the, the man left. And, um, I, and I, I told them in, told them in, in a meeting. I told them, uh, not uh, letting them know everything that I had already heard, but I said, there are certain things I won't do. I will never be the treasurer, ever, for my own sake. I'm not going to touch it. I'm not going to be the treasurer. And I said, there are certain other things you don't want me to do because I don't have the skill to do that. I'd have to develop it, and that, how long is that going to take? There are certain things you just don't want me to do, and I will refuse to do it. I'm here to be primarily, you know, I'll do my, I'll do my part as a member of the church, but I'm being hired as a preacher, not as anything else. That's what I'm being hired to do. Now, I will do things as a member of the church, as a servant should, but I, I, uh, I'm not going to be the one you hire to do everything. And there was a different congregation. It seems as though they were hiring a softball coach, believe it or not, and were greatly disappointed. You could see it in the man's face concerning me and softball of, I don't play softball. <laughs> you really don't want me to. Not if you plan on serious anything. You, you, don't, you don't want me doing that. Uh, you know, if you want a coach, the world's full of coaches. All right, hire one of them. And don't pretend that you're the church. But if you want a preacher, all right, that's different. That's different. The, that's what the church does. That's what the church hires. Now, verse 13. Do you not know that those... Are, yeah, we've, we've read verse 13. Let's go to 14. Even so, the Lord has commanded those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. Confirmation here. Inspired by the Holy Spirit. But I have used none of these things. Nor will, nor, nor have I written these things that it should be done so to me. But it would be better for me to die than that anyone should make my boasting void. Now we'll get to this in just a second. But he's not writing this so that they will now start supporting him. He's not, that's not his point. That's not his point at all. His point is the basic principle that it should be done. He's not going to accept it for himself, 
but others need to have it. Others need to have it. And uh, Paul is never a, uh, uh, a located preacher as such that is going to be there indefinitely. Uh, he, is, he is there for short periods of time, maybe a year here, maybe a year and a half there, maybe shorter than that. And uh, he is planting congregations and then coming back and revisiting those places to see how they're doing. Uh, that's what he does. But each and every one of those congregations have to have somebody located there. And he does mention, I planted, Apollos watered, and God gave the increase. Okay, the planting, that's a one-time deal, really. That's, you, you come and you plant the seed in the ground. You make sure that the seed is good, otherwise you're going to have to replant it. Things are growing. Uh, you didn't have the birds come and, and take it all away. That it's, it's growing. But the one who's watering, that's not just a one-off thing. That's not just one time and then you go. That is a constant process. That's what's done. All right? He planted the congregation, but a man like Apollos, he is there. He's located there. He sees the congregation week to week, day to day, year to year. He is there. And he is not saying this so that to shame them of, we never gave anything to Paul. He never required anything out of us. He was always here free of charge. And now we've got to give him something. He is, he's working very, very carefully with them and gently with them trying to raise them up. And there are certain things about this congregation he would know that we wouldn't know. And that isn't necessarily communicated uh, in this letter because we don't really need to know everything. But he would know certain things. He would know where they've come from. He would know their basic attitudes. He would know their situations. And, uh, but now let's, let's go to the last part of this, for it would be better for me to die than, uh, than uh, that anyone should make my boasting void. Uh, look at what he says. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. Notice what he's saying. If I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. That's a Greek way of saying something. Let's say it more directly for our ears. Since I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. He has nothing to boast of concerning preach. Does he preach the gospel? Yes, he does. Does he have anything to boast of? No, no, he doesn't. Then he explains, for necessity has laid it upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have, I have been entrusted with a stewardship. So he is saying this has been laid upon him. He has nothing to boast of concerning preaching the gospel. He has nothing to boast of at all because this has been given to him, been given to him by Christ. And if he does it willingly, he's got a reward. There's a reward for that. And if he's doing it unwillingly, yet he has a stewardship. He's still... Has, knows that obligation. He still has to do it. Now, he did it willingly, and he did it with love. There's a, a man who didn't do this in love. Love of it would not be taking the sacrifices he's taking. There's no way he'd be doing it. No way. And what he has described already is a soldier going to war, paying his own way or that of working in a vineyard and receiving no benefit from the vineyard at all. Someone who tends the flocks receives no benefit from the flocks whatsoever. All right. He is required to be the soldier, the vine dresser, and the shepherd. He's, requ he's required to, to, uh, to be a preacher and a missionary. He's required to preach the gospel. And because of that requirement, he, there's nothing to boast in that. 
nothing to boast at all. We simply go back to chapter 2, verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That is a very humble view of Himself and presenting Himself humbly. It's not Paul the Great, Paul the Magnificent, Paul the Wise, Paul the Ever-Knowing. It is just Paul the servant. That's all. And uh, we have come to the end of our time, and we'll continue next week. Thank you, everybody.